The Plan Air Easton podcast is brought to you by the Avalon Foundation, enriching the lives of those on the eastern shore of Maryland through the arts. Visit avalonfoundation.org for details on events, performances, and educational programming offered throughout the year. Today's episode is sponsored by JFM Enterprises, providing distinctive ready-made and custom frames and moldings to the trade since 1974. Visit jfm.net to view their catalog of designs. I don't recognize you not drenched in sweat. I think most people are just used to seeing me in uh, uh, dry fits and Bermuda shorts and soaking with wet. So. I really, I really felt like this year um, could be the year that Plan Air Easton killed you. One guy said he wasn't going to come back here because when he left Vietnam, he said he would never go in that type of heat again, so he wouldn't come back here anymore. <laughs> it's really great when your art festival is um, compared to war, you know? <laughs> like, <laughs> it's, it is something that you have to get up for. Like, you have to plan, I mean, you have to get in shape for it. You can't just show up. And to be honest with you, the, the Iron Man was easier than Easton last year. <laughs> <laughs> That's awful. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome to Plein Air Podcast. I am Tim Wagon, and I'm with Jess Bellis. Hi. Today, we had a great conversation with our friend Pat McDaniel, who's been a great supporter, a champion of this podcast, a sponsor of Plein Air Easton um, and this podcast. And God, he's just such a nice guy. Yeah. I mean, he's a really nice guy. Yes. I would actually vote for him for president. I would. He's a very nice. That guy. is a really interesting concept. I feel like, I feel like there are a lot of people in the field, but not a lot of people have um, committed to a candidate yet. Exactly. That's why I brought it up. That's exactly why. So I said Pat it. McDaniel for president. That's exactly. Framing why I said America's it. future. He, oh, he, a perfect framing right. America's future. He's, he, you know, yeah, and he could do it with light colors and dark on the outside, and it would be a perfect little. Uh, Yard flag. He would have really. He would give the American people really high customer service. Who doesn't want that? Exactly. <laughs> um, so I hope you. I hope you learn something about framing. I think he's got some really cool tips about what to consider when you're choosing a frame, and also some pointers as to where trends are headed. And it's just a different look from from the whole process uh, from the, the framer side. So it's a very interesting conversation. Absolutely, check it out. Here we go. Well, we're speaking with. Pat McDaniels from JFM Framing. Uh, Pat, welcome to the Plein Air Podcast. Thank you, guys. Glad to be here. <laughs> Pat has been a great sponsor of Plein Air Easton for years and has um, schlepped one million frames around Easton in um, temperatures that are like, what, 150 degrees Fahrenheit? Inside the truck. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah. Inside the truck, up the stairs, around the corner, um, wherever he needs to go, I think is is where he's he's been. So we're grateful for for all of your support and your sponsorship over time. Thank you. And you're a very popular guy uh, when you come into town, uh, Pat. I, I, just to start off, we're going to get into some different things here today. I think because we are talking to a framer versus a painter. But how many frames are you carrying around in that in that in that truck that you bring up uh, to town? Well. Last year, I pushed it to the absolute max, and I know this because we blew two tires. So I know the maximum Stop. number of frames that I can bring to any event is 1,400. <laughs> and so I'm go going there to go back There are probably the other, other ways that you could test that besides um, filling your truck till the tires blow out. I found out the hard way. <laughs> <laughs> so somewhere around 1,000 to 1,100 is a good number, uh, and that number is represents enough of every size, every style, every finish that the artist might need while I'm at the event. And, and I, I, I read in your bio that you've been sort of traveling to plein air events like ours for the last um, seven or eight years. I'm sure you've learned a lot um, by doing that. What, what are some of the other festivals that you go to? Are, are, is ours the biggest one? Like when you say you filled the truck to the max, is it because it's the most? It, the, this is where you're seeing the most sales? Uh, or right up there? Yes. Yes, it's that. And we also get a lot of pre-orders from the artists because you have so many artists in the event. So you yeah, have more artists true. in your event than any, any other event that I do. So I need more. I probably just need a bigger truck, to be honest with you. <laughs> um, but get I'm not the man really a bigger truck. It. Yeah. I started, my first event was uh, Forgotten Coast down in Florida. And I right. had met at the first plein air convention, which I think was 2012, uh, a gentleman came up to me and, and introduced himself as the director of the show and invited me to come down and 
you know, set up some tables and it wasn't really anything I'd ever done. And it didn't sound like, you know, there was a, a huge guarantee of success, but because, I, so prior to that, most of your sales were direct from your warehouse. We've been on the road technically for about 45 years. So yeah. my father started the company out of the back of our uh, family maxi van, you know, the old, sort of a passenger, 15 passenger van style vans. That's what we had. And so every Sunday after church, he would take the seats out of the, the back of the truck and load them up with picture frames. He would head out on Monday morning and come back on Friday. And so that's how we started and that's how he started. So we've just not ever really been able to get off the road completely. So we, sure. we sort of, um, uh, evolved into uh, southeastern delivery. We did that for a while uh, when the recession came in the 2007, 8, 9, 10, probably went all the way into 13. Yeah. Uh, we kind of came off the road. We just didn't have the orders uh, to fill the truck. So um, this kind of put us back on the road. Um, I do about eight events a year, maybe maybe seven events a year where I physically am on site. And are the they event. all, are they all plein air events? They're all plein air events. Uh, awesome. so it might be, uh, you know, you've got forgotten coast, you've got plein air South, which is part of forgotten coast. Right. I do the lighthouse, which is down in, uh, to Cuesta, Florida, Palm beach area. Um, I used to do Richmond, uh, every year, but that one, that one went away. Um, I do plein air, Texas, and that's about as far as I drive. That's about a 1,200 mile drive. That's pretty far. Yeah, you gotta have you gotta have your tires really straight before you leave you on that have, on that one. <laughs> you can't you can't take 1,400 frames there? You no, just can't. no, no. What kind of changes have you seen across the events over the eight years that you've been kind of on the road at plein air events? Are there any like kind of tr trends that you have observed changing? Well, for my purposes, what has been a huge benefit to doing the mobile sponsor i'll call them mobile sponsorships for lack of a better term i think it's a great term uh, yeah it's just on-site presence is the number of artists that grow each time we come so we we do have access to the competition artists which is our main focus but in order to make the numbers work we have to have the local artists uh, that can come from the surrounding areas and the more we go to an event the more people we get year after year and that number seems to grow. So then the competition artists stay the same, uh, but the number of uh, local artists uh, tends to grow. So, uh, but as far as the events themselves, Does, I don't. It, it, do you think that that is because the word is spreading that that it, that it is an opportunity to buy frames, or do you have an inkling that there are just more artists participating in this craft? A little bit of both. I yeah. think um, as the movement grows, I think more people are just coming to hang out. They might just be coming to do the, the, the paint out yep. uh, or they might just be coming to watch artists and learn for free and, you know, have some interaction with the artists, walk right up to the easel and gain some insight into uh, maybe a technique that they're, unfamiliar with or um i don't know exactly but um so i i don't know i have a, i don't know that i can say it's changed significantly since the first time i began doing them but um it for me it's just a great opportunity to see new artists uh see some old friends you know there's Maybe a 20% return rate, you know, sure. per event. Maybe it's a little bit more than that. But so, um, so I may not see him at your event. I might see him at the next event. But uh, it's just a great opportunity to connect with people, to give them great service, and and just to uh, maybe keep the other guy out. I don't know. <laughs> there, that's honest. <laughs> and, and you make all these frames, Pat? You make them in your factory? Okay, so we are an importer of ready-made frames. So that's primarily what I bring to the events. That's probably 80% of what is on my truck. The other 20% are custom-made frames that we make in our warehouse. Um, and those are usually things that are pre-ordered by the artists because they are custom. And we make them to size. They may not be the, a standard size that we carry, or it may just be a style that is not available as a, a ready-made frame. Was your dad, when he was he importing the uh, frames back in 1975 when this started, same way? Or was he making frames? 
he no, he never made frames. Uh, I bought the business from my father in 1998. We started making frames in 2000. Got it. And, is uh, your father still alive? He is alive. He had a stroke on Christmas Eve. Oh and, no! Uh, so he's not not the guy that we once knew him as. So he's he's having some tough days, but uh, he's still around. He still recognizes me, and uh, he's got some dementia, and he he may not remember if I visited him yesterday or last week. But um, I was going to ask if he was proud of the, what you've done with the business as a father to a son. You know, I think at the end, you know, as he's getting close to the end of his lifetime, I think the things that he's most proud of are his family, uh, this business, and how it has um, sort of continued in his absence. Yeah. And then just some other things that he did during his life that um, that, that were important to him. He played college football, and uh, so he has good memories of that. And Awesome. So, but mainly, it's and you and you have a big family, right? You have, it's six, six. Are there six of you total, or are there seven of you total? So I have two brothers and four sisters. Awesome. Uh, I'm the youngest boy, and I have a younger sister, so I'm six out of seven. And uh, over the years, uh, each of us has taken a turn at JFM Enterprises. Everybody had to get in the van. Get in the Everybody van. Get in, get the, in the, the van. van. <laughs> One time or another. But that those. Ten years lasted anywhere from one day. One of my brothers. Uh, <laughs> he was my like, dad didn't, he was did like no way. <laughs> no way. I can't work for that guy. Uh, to me, I've been there about thirty years. In addition to when I worked, you know, as a kid. So. So, um, do you have a household that has a lot of art in it, or are you just too busy running around? Like, do you have a an art collection of your own? Well, that's a great question. Jess, I wish I could say I had some really <laughs> valuable investment art, but I do have some pieces that some of the artists have given me. Uh -huh. and those are important to me. Of course. Um, I don't know if you they can have, see behind they me. Have mem because they have memories connected to them too, right? Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Uh, I've had a number of artists that have painted our truck at the paint outs. <laughs> and uh, I guess, you know, in some cases they look around and they don't see anything interesting to paint. So it looks interesting to see, you know, a thousand frames sitting on a, on a hot asphalt parking lot. Uh, so we've, <laughs> we've gotten a few of those and I've gotten some of those as gifts. Um, yeah. But I mainly have, you know, still have the art that our children did when they were in of school. course, like, sometimes that's the most valuable art that you can have. It, it is, uh, and since I do still have, <laughs> and uh, I bet, I bet, kids, I bet they're really well framed too. They are well framed. <laughs> it's not, it's not that. like my kids' art that's like stuck up to the refrigerator with magnets. I bet you yours, yours is displayed very well. Yeah, <laughs> unless it's custom, then they get, then they got to figure out their own framing, I guess. <laughs> I I can't help but notice for those of you guys can't see, but behind you, Pat, there is a painting, a, a nice sort of abstract of some maybe desert or skyline, which actually has no frame on it. I, I wonder if that was irony or, or <laughs> <laughs> there's actually no frame on it. It's, you know, it's shameful that I have something like this behind me. But <laughs> this is not representational art, which I know is uh, sort of a mandate in the plein air world. Uh, this is a I don't know. It's getting it's getting more and more abstract every day. I feel like. I think you're right. I, I'm I am seeing that. I, that feels exciting to me. Yeah, uh, but this is a local artist here in Atlanta, Bobby Sykes, that uh, that gave me this piece. So it's beautiful. And I should have a frame on it. You're right. So um, so so now now we're gonna now the now I have to ask you all the truth the truth telling questions like um. When people are choosing frames for their paintings, how often do you agree with the choices? Most of the time, but I am not <laughs> afraid to tell somebody, mm, I don't know. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, my advice is free. And uh, often they ask me, what, what do you think? Uh -huh. You know, I, I try to keep in mind what everybody else is using so that, you know, not everybody has the same frame at an event. But just I try to frame, you know, help them with each piece individually. And so that's the beauty of me being at an event is there are a thousand plus frames there. There are a lot of choices, a lot of different right. finishes, a lot of different styles. You can duck and weave. And if people say, oh, I'm, I'm going towards silver, you can say, well, here's four different silver. Here's a thicker one and a thinner one. Or um, Who do you think chooses better frames, 
artists themselves or collectors who are framing or reframing something? In your like aesthetic opinion, who's better at doing it? That's a very good question. I think the um, we don't necessarily see the collector. Yeah, I guess that's true. Uh, most of the customers that we are able to service at the events are actually local artists, and they kind of know what they want. They they have tried enough of our frames to know, okay, I did really well with the light gray finish, or I did really well with gold gold finishes. Where are those? Um, so I don't I don't know that I can speak to that. But even with the studio work and stuff you do, the artists themselves are your primary um, client. Our customers, I would say 95% of them are artists or art galleries. Mm, got it. Okay. And uh, that's changed over the years. Um, there was a time when 50% of our business were people that uh, imported Chinese oil paintings came to us for the frames, put them on trucks, took them up and down the road and sold them to furniture stores, right. gift stores, interior designers. So that was like almost a whole a whole other industry. What happened to that industry? Uh, it died a horrible death, which is <laughs> great for the plein air movement. <laughs> During the yes! recession, and uh, there there are still some heartbeats out We, we out took them out. <laughs> okay, I'm them out. The recession came, so that was no longer lucrative. But d did the internet have something to do with that too? You think? The internet changed everything in my business. I'm sure. And the reason why is because we used to be sort of a catalog-based company, and most of the artists that had our catalogs were were are and still are fairly loyal to us. Would, would just reorder from the catalog. But when the internet became so prevalent, there are now so many more choices for buying frames, whether or not they are the same quality, they might look the same online. And right. as long as they're available, they, you know, they may go that direction. But there are so many choices for the customer that didn't exist before, or at least they weren't aware of them. So there aren't very many companies that really are true wholesale like we are. Um, and that really operate this, this type of business that we do. So um, I, I suppose there are a number of online retailers, and that's probably our biggest competition. But again, for the art, even for the art themselves, when you're talking about the imported Chinese oils that were being driven up and down the coast, like that went away because the furniture stores could go online and order what they wanted too, right? Or they just went out of business. So many companies... Just retailers went, went out of business uh, during the, uh, the recession. recession. The other layer of customers, we used to have about 10 or 15 percent to frame shops. And again, probably half really of them dropped off, you know, or it became something different. It became more of a gallery than, than a frame shop. Uh, so, Well, and the consolidation of frame shops into the sort of big michaels or the sort of big box stores i know that that has Bobby. led to yeah led to con some consolidation here locally where we've had some of the you know local frame shops um have to the go away when the big box stores came in mm -hmm. um well but just like a pair of shoes you know it's really nice to be able to try on some frames and i think that that's one of the cool things having you be sort of the mobile sponsorship that you do at these events is it's a great opportunity for people to come out and try on different frames basically right exactly and you know i just tried to put sort of a business model around it after i did the first one i was encouraged enough to know that okay there's something here but there has to be a lot of planning that goes into these events because you can't just throw a bunch of frames on a truck. You have to have a large number of every size. You have to have plenty of finishes, as I said before, for the artist to choose from. And it's just, uh, there's expense to it. And uh, there just is a lot of planning that goes into it, but it's a good business. It's probably represents about 15% of our sales for the year. So it's important. The, the plein air events that you do in plein air person. Events. Yes. That's awesome. And it really does as, I mean, make a huge difference watching 
all of these paintings being made over the course of a week, and then the artist having coming back and saying, "Up, oh, up, oh, it's not quite finished yet. I've got to frame it." And then they put that frame on it, and then it totally takes the painting, what you thought was a beautiful painting, even further into like, "Wow, that is really, really something." So, um, it's something that you wouldn't, you don't really think of when you're just walking around and say looking at, at uh, you know, to buy art in, in in any type of store or whatever. But when you when you actually watch the process. The frame is just a huge, huge part of, of, of the finished product. Absolutely. And I think it's a huge advantage for the customers that we're able to service at these events to have all these choices and to be able to paint and frame specifically for the piece that they painted. Because they don't always they don't always know what they're going to do. I mean, I've definitely and, and you've helped us solve problems on site where somebody did buy, let's say, the dark colored frame. And then they're like, oh, I just wish I had a silver frame for this. I wish I could swap it out. And they're, you know, calling other artists to see if anybody has a silver eight by ten frame or whatever, because they've they've they thought they were going to paint one way. And then they ended up sort of getting something that they feel like would be um, displayed better in another frame. So it, it does make a really big difference. Oh, yeah, it really does. It really does. And I think it also takes, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but uh, it takes a lot of the planning aspect uh, away from the artist. So if they don't want to plan, if they are flying in from out of state, or they just don't have enough good competition quality frames, then it's nice to just be able to show up and know that there's going to be somebody there that you can find frames for every piece that you could possibly paint. We definitely see that too, yeah, year in, year out. I didn't even know what it meant the first year. They're like, where's JFM? I'm like, I, I don't know what JFM is. Is that a stereo company? I don't know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> and, and But now they're like, yeah, well, I'm ready. Where's JFM? And they'll have eight or, eight or ten paintings to frame. So it is, it is a, a, a big bonus for them. Yeah. So talk to us about any other framing trends that are out there or anything that you would want, you know, as we get, as the weather does get warmer, haha, um, and people are, we're headed, headed into plein air season. Is there anything that any advice or any tips that you'd give people as they're preparing to go to these festivals that you're going to be at in terms of wh- where you're seeing trends go or things that they might consider? I mean, I, I think your, your, your point to get in touch with you early so that you can bring exactly what they want to the event is pretty good tip that's a good place to start (laughs) i would say the biggest trend right now in framing is the use of floater frames what does that mean well a floater is for for example this canvas behind me that has no frame on it but it's painted (laughs) on a gallery wrap depth canvas so most frames are thin in the back and the the canvas is going to stick out the back so the floater frame was created so that that guy has a place to to lay within the, the opening of the frame without sticking out the back of the frame. So it's really designed for the gallery wrap canvas. So a lot of artists are using them, but they do require a lot of, a little bit of advanced planning. So That would be hard at a plein air event because the sides would still be wet, right? Sides, you've got panels that are really difficult to, to uh, incorporate into a floater unless you have the materials necessary to, uh, to mount them. So they, they do just require a little bit of planning. So normally what I will do is before the event, anybody that's interested in floater frames will just give me a call and we'll go over what type of uh, uh, surface are you painting on, uh, what color do you want, and we'll, we'll kind of come up with some things that will work for them. We'll pre-mount some uh, boards that they can just, you know, pop them on once they're finished. So, uh, But we sell – a lot of frames here and almost one out of every five is a floater frame. So there you go. There are huge floater frames. frames. <laughs> yep, gotcha. There it is. And I noticed last year that um, some of the artists in plain air Easton w- were allowed to paint some bigger sizes. I don't know if you guys expanded the, uh, size restrictions or what but uh, we have not we've not expanded our size restrictions in a really long time i think that um it it sort of depends on the class of artists that are coming but i think at plein air easton artists tend to paint bigger than at other competitions i've heard i've heard that you know it's kind of crazy we've been doing plein air easton for 15 years but um 
I've never really been to another competition, so I don't really know what, what everybody else does everywhere else. But I hear that, you know, they paint big at Easton. I think we have such a, a stable, strong collector base that, you know, big paintings tend to have a higher price tag, and we tend to be able to bring some of those um, more uh, high-ticket buyers to our event. So I think that that's one of the reasons why we're we're bigger okay. from a size standpoint. Yeah. Um, but I, I think we are bigger. I think you're right. I don't see that in other places. I see, you know, maybe a 24 by 24 as being sort of the, the biggest size. one. Big frames and floater frames are where it's at this year is what uh, uh, Pat's saying, right? So Well, not big frames themselves. I mean, I think, I think that that's a mistake that I've seen made is, you know, you can have a frame that competes with your painting, too. You know, if you have something that is too big or too ornate, you know, sometimes that can turn people off. I agree with that. I also think that there are some paintings where, you know, the artist cannot produce 10 or 12 good paintings. They, they produce maybe six that they're really happy with and the other six might need some help. And sometimes it, it's not a bad idea to overframe a little bit if you're just really not happy with what you came up with, but you still have to turn in X number of paintings. That's a really so. good mm -hmm. pointer yeah. there too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm learning a heck of a lot during this framing conversation here. <laughs> I'm sure other people are too. Um, Let me just add one thing. I was going to say, big, I think I actually part. have a floater frame. I think my Vanderhoek, my Kim Vanderhoek one is in a floater frame. I'm going to look at it more closely when I get home now that I know about what a floater uh, yeah. frame is. Yeah. What do you want to say, Pat? I was just going to add that to the artist that is allowed to paint whatever the max size is, and it's you know quite large like what we were just talking about, that there's a little bit of a... Uh, maybe a strategy or a risk factor there if it doesn't sell and the artist is out of state or, um, you know, flew in or whatever, and that has to be shipped back and it has mm -hmm. to be shipped motor freight because it didn't sell. So there's a little bit of a, uh, a strategy that goes into that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Or unless the artist has a local outlet for that item. Right. It doesn't sell. So anyway, just something to think about. Did you ever have any <laughs> artists yell at you for doing the wrong thing, giving you a broken frame or said mess, you messed up an order or that type of thing? That is a great question. I'm so glad you asked me that because I have to give credit to somebody. Um, maybe, maybe it was eight years ago. Uh, one of the artists, I saw him at the plein air convention and he would hardly speak to me. <laughs> and so I went and I introduced I didn't know him well, but I introduced myself again and he said, you know, you really did me wrong at this event. It was a plein air event the previous year. And we had shipped in some frames that came in from China. They were bu bubble wrapped. We did not look at them. We sent them directly to the show. Well, he painted all week. And when he got ready to frame his pieces, he opened up the wrapping of every single one of them. And they were all peeling. The leaf, gold leaf had peeled <gasps> underneath oh, no. the, the bronze stain. And so... We didn't know, had we known earlier in the week, we would have gotten him new frames. And anyway, he had to scramble uh, and he was very angry about it, but he gave me a second chance to service him again. And so I'm really grateful for that. But more importantly, he gave me the opportunity to understand what is involved at these events. So if I'm on site, I can handle any problem. I've had tons of frames, we can swap out frames. There, there aren't any problems really in that sense. But if we're shipping to a customer, and we do ship to a lot of events, uh, we have to inspect the frame carefully. We have to make sure there are no problems that they're going to, because they are probably going to wait until the last minute. That's just the nature of you know, In part because they'd the want to keep, yeah, and in part they would want to keep the frames from being damaged, I would think, too. You know, you keep them all bubble wrapped up until you're going to use them so you don't ding them up in your car or your host house or whatever. Exactly. Right, yeah, right, yeah. Sure. And they trust us. They've ordered enough from us. They trust us. We're not going to send them something bad to an event. So Pat, we, I really, we can't. I, I love this story because, you know, I think we as a as an events organization are constantly asking for feedback and we want to hear when people are dissatisfied and we because we want to fix our best practices. And that is so smart to 
I, I love that story because it is somebody teaching you the part that you wouldn't know as the seller. Like, and it is probably a simple best practice for you to incorporate that could ensure your customer service by tenfold. You know, I think that that's, you know, we love to be able to tweak our best practices as often as possible, and it's it's through having those open dialogues that you can actually do that. And I think that's something that kind of sets us apart is we are very customer centric here and we, it does not matter if it's one frame for one customer, we are going to take care of that customer. And um, I always feel bad when a customer calls up to complain and they say, they start with, I know I'm not your biggest customer. And we stop them right there and we just say, right now you're the most important thing I have going on. So please tell me about your problem. And we always take care of it. We Try to see do. how to fix it. We're not going to let a frame be the reason why we lose a customer. And we also appreciate the fact that they are telling us about it and giving us a chance to make it better and not go into the other guy. Well, I, I feel like every time your name is mentioned, it's followed with, he's such a nice guy. So you do definitely have that reputation, yeah. I think. I'm not sure everybody knew that you were a uh, Iron Man, but they can, we can start throwing that out there now. We just found that out through your bio. That's really interesting, too. It's so. because he has he's to train. Nice Iron he, Man he has guy. to train to come to Plenary Easton, so it's so daggone hot. Like I said, it, this year he was, during Quick Draw, when it was 143 degrees outside, and he was working out of the back of that truck, I thought he is actually being cooked. I thought that that was like an oven. I, I I really wish that we could have taken a thermometer out there and found out how hot it was in that truck. But I was truly worried about your health. <laughs> it was horrible. I, I think doing Iron Man actually did help me just learn to persevere. It does not matter what it is. You just got to get through it. And, you know. Plenary Easton. Plenary Easton. It doesn't matter how hard it is. You just have to get through it. Exactly. And you can. And, and you it's not for like Iron the Man. Iron Man where I can, I can just stop anytime if I want to. I know my family will still love me. But I can't do that in Easton because no, no one's going to. No, we will not still love you if you uh, <laughs> you got to make it to the bitter end. Well, um, th- this just in, um, uh, Marie did confirm to us that at Plenary Easton, the maximum size um, for, for paintings is 44 by 50, frame inclusive. And that's kind of a funny story, you know, that there's two questions that were kind of asked a lot. And one is, why do you have 58 artists at Plenary Easton? And the reason why is because when we measured the exhibition halls at um, the Academy Art Museum the first time and did some basic math, that's how many fit around the perimeter. (laughs) So that's how we get to 58. It's not some magic numerology. It really was some basic math. And um, there was a year that um, Tim Bell painted a really huge painting. I think it was in like year three, maybe. And we never conceived that someone would paint such a big painting at a plein air event that uh, prior to that, we did not have a maximum canvas size. So we added a maximum canvas size and we deemed it the Tim Bell rule that was making it so that the math would hold up around the, the perimeter 58 people, yeah. for 58 people. And we had to add the John Brandon Sills addendum to that maximum canvas size because he had a frame one year that I think weighed 900 pounds <laughs> and was about, I don't know, 14 inches in. <laughs> it was the biggest frame I've ever seen. That painting must have weighed I don't even know how much, and um, and so we had to add the the frame inclusive to um to keep everybody within the within the boundaries. So that's that's our framing story. Forty four by fifty, Pat. Forty four by fifty. Frame, frame inclusive. inclusive. Frame inclusive. I'll, I'll back. I'll back. I'll work backwards. I'll work backwards. <laughs> <laughs> um, just real quick, I want to talk about current events here. I mean, you, you, are you shipping in from China every day? I mean, weekly? No, we only we only bring in probably two containers a year from China. We get most of our property or Products. pre-made frame pre-made frames from Mexico. We okay. also buy a lot of molding from domestic distributors, but we also that that's kind of what we bring in from China. I was going to ask about the coronavirus, obviously, so I just didn't know if it was some situation or, or whatever, because that seems to be affecting everything right now. Um, I will tell you, I feel so sorry for this factory owner that we deal with. No, number one, the Trump tariffs have almost shut him down. He right. lost 75% of his U.S. customers, and his factory is currently 
not operating because of the coronavirus. So. The quarantine. Right. Yeah. No, it's a, it's it's a real it's a real deal for sure. It's affect it's going to affect everything. I think. I mean, it's affecting certainly our investments. It's inf- affecting the stock market and all sorts of things. And that's that's those are the self interested pieces. Again, I feel so sorry for the countries that are really affected. It's just awful. Right. Um, well, that's kind of a downer to end. A good question, well, Tim. No, that I, really like uh, ends it on a low note. I think that <laughs> you can think about that and then just think like when you don't end up. Uh, you know, getting a call from the coronavirus, there's going to be plenary Easton to look forward to in this July. It'll be plenty hot enough. I'm not um, sure that that was a good pivot. <laughs> I gave it a shot. Yeah. Um, Pat, you're coming down again to plenary Easton this year, right? Thank you. Coming Is that up. a formal invitation? I hope so. I hope coming so. Up, coming up. Coming up. So, coming up. Coming up. Yeah, I, I'm really sort of directionally impaired. That's one of that's one of my things. Is I can't I can't read a map. Don't don't follow me anywhere. <laughs> it's awful. It's awful. All right, well, Marie's my go-to person at uh, Plain Air Easton. So as long as as long as I get a uh, confirmation from her, I'm in. That's awesome. That's awesome. It was so great talking to you today, Pat. You're, you are such a great guy, and we're so glad to have you as part of the, the Plein Air Easton team. If people want to um, check out your frames, I bet they can do so online. They can. Our website is jfm.net. Very simple. Totally www.jfm.net. We have a new website launch in uh, April, maybe May of this year. A uh, more interactive site and uh so, yeah, uh, check us out online or send me an email to pat.mcdaniel at jfm.net. That sounds awesome. Thank you so much, Pat. Thanks for your sponsorship of Plenary Easton, for your patronage and sponsorship of this podcast. We really appreciate it. It's been great talking to you. Thank you nice for talking everything. to you, Pat. Thank you. Okay, take care. I would encourage you to go to your favorite podcast app. I would encourage you to click subscribe. I would encourage you to comment, like, share, and spread the word about what we're talking about. And um, drop us a line anytime if there are guests you want to hear from or topics you want us to cover. We're having a good time with this, but we would like probably have a better time if you guys reached out. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, an art podcast is a very unique, um, you know, uh, sort of uh, media. And... We're learning it. We're figuring out, as Al likes to say, we're finding our way through the process of doing it. Um, And uh, I want to make sure we thank MCTV downstairs at Avalon for spending the months and months to figure out how to get RSS feeds. And I still don't know what that is. I I know. I know. know It's always capitalized. RSS feed. The Plein Air Easton podcast is brought to you by the Avalon Foundation and was produced by Nick Richards. Our theme music was generously provided by Blue Dot Sessions with additional episode music by Poddington Bear. Remember to rate, comment, and subscribe. You can learn more about Plan Air Easton at planairisten.com. <laughs>